When you think of sports cars, you might think of the Germans with Porsche and BMW, or maybe the Italians with Ferrari and Lamborghini, or maybe even the Americans with the Corvette and the Mustang. You probably don't think of the Dutch. And yet, this is a Spyker C8 Spider, and it is an exotic sports car from the Netherlands. And we're only just scratching the surface of this car's quirks. Before I show you all those quirks, a little overview. The C8 is manufactured by Spyker, which is a Dutch company probably best known for this car and for the very messy purchase of Saab in 2010 when General Motors wanted nothing to do with them. That move almost sent Spyker into bankruptcy, but they're still around, they're still making cars, and in fact, they're still making the C8, which has been around since 2000 in various evolutions. The latest version is called the C8 Prelator, and it looks a lot like this one except with some more modern touches and design features. Under the hood, which by the way is back here, the C8 uses a 4.2 liter V8 borrowed from Audi, which makes between 400 and 620 horsepower depending on which one you get. In the United States, spikers are incredibly rare. They only made something like 250, 300 cars for the entire world, and only a small fraction of those have come to the United States since they started importing them in 2005. Today, I've borrowed this spiker from a viewer in Carlsbad, California, near San Diego, and I'm going to show you all of its unusual quirks and features, there are very, very many. And then I'm going to take it out on the road and tell you what it's like to drive a spiker, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. Before I get into the quirks, a little overview of this car's pricing. I have no doubt you've never seen one before, so this is an original spiker pricing window sticker. In fact, it's the original window sticker for this car, and as you can see, the original asking price wasn't cheap, at just a shade under $300,000. Amazingly, spikers still sell for big money, between $200,000 and 400,000 according to the owner of this car depending on the specifics of the car and frankly how many shoppers are in the market is this is a niche car with a rather small pool of potential buyers anyway for more of my thoughts on the spiker experience click the link below to read my column about my day with the spiker on autotrader.com slash oversteer now it's time to start with the cool quirks and features Now, I'll start this on the outside with the doors. You walk up to a spiker and you look all around the doors looking for the door handle, but you won't find one. That's because this car doesn't have a traditional door handle. So, how do you open the doors? Well, it turns out you push a little button on the mirror housing and the door pops right up. That's pretty easy, but then again, buttons? I mean, come on, that's, that's so old school. There is also another way to open the doors. Press a little button on the key fob and the door opens right up, and that is really cool. But I'm not ready to move inside the Spiker just yet because there are so many weird quirks to cover in the exterior, like for example, the windows. First off, just look at this frameless window line that makes a U shape around the entire car. You will never see windows like that again in any other car. The owner tells me there's a soft top that could be installed, but it's ugly, it's difficult to install, and he lives in San Diego, so he doesn't really need it. But those are the windows in this thing, and they are crazy. Maybe even crazier? You notice how the side windows roll down, but only a little bit? That's because only the bottom part of the side window actually rolls down. You can roll it down or up, but you can't roll down the entire window. Instead, that's all you get. Another interesting quirk of this car can be found around back, and that would be Spiker's logo, which is an old-time airplane propeller. Now, as you look around this car, you'll notice that there are two basic themes. Number one is aviation, and number two is aluminum. I'll show you what I mean as I continue throughout this. Another thing that's interesting about the logo is it says Spiker on the top, like you'd expect. Then there's the airplane propeller, and then on the bottom, there's Latin text, which translates to, for the tenacious, no road is impassable. I guess. Anyway, the interesting thing about the logo is you can find it in a lot of places throughout this car. In fact, one could argue it's sort of the unofficial third theme of this car. Maybe the most interesting place is on the exhausts. The airplane propeller obviously doesn't appear on the exhaust, but take a look there. You see Spiker, and then there's that Latin motto. It's on both exhausts in the back. Now, like I just said, the Spiker logo is sort of the unofficial third theme of this car, and the logo appears in a lot of places. For example, here it is in the gas cap, and this isn't just a gas cap with a logo printed on it. The gas cap is the logo, and the propeller part is where you put your hands in order to get leverage to unscrew it or screw it back in after you've got gas. Pretty clever. 
Another interesting place the Spiker logo appears, how about the windshield? And in fact, all the glass. A lot of car companies put their brand name on the glass, but Spiker puts its logo, and I have to admit, it does look pretty cool. Now also in this general vicinity, you'll find two other interesting things, one of which on the mirror housing is the turn signal on the side of the car. Europe requires that all cars sold in Europe have turn signals on the side, in addition to the front and the back, and this is where Spiker decided to integrate it into the mirror housing. And speaking of the mirror housing, remember how I told you aluminum is a theme in this car? Look at this mirror housing. It's just this giant aluminum windswept piece, and you can't fold it in or push it away or pull it in any direction. It's just there, looking nice. And in keeping with this car's aluminum theme, the mirror housing isn't the only piece of aluminum on the exterior of this car. There's also aluminum on the doors where you go to push them down and close them. There's aluminum in the windows for the part that separates the part that rolls down from the part that's fixed. There's aluminum below the doors. There's aluminum roll hoops behind the seats. You already saw the fuel doors aluminum. And then there's maybe the most interesting piece of aluminum on the entire car. That would be the front splitter, which is this large aluminum piece that goes all the way down the side of the car, creating sort of an unbroken line of aluminum until it reaches the back wheels. This is not something you want to damage, as I suspect replacing this piece would not be cheap. But back to lighting for a second. Now, I already showed you those little LED turn signals on the mirror housings on the side of the car, but what about the turn signals back here? Do you recognize them from anything? They come from the Lamborghini Diablo, and so do the brake lights. And there's at least one other piece of interesting lighting in the Spyker. Now, when the doors are up, Spyker didn't put a reflector on them to let people know that the doors are up. Instead, they went with a little LED light strip that lets passersby know they should be careful because the doors are up, as if you could possibly miss it in this car. The LED light strip also provides a little extra illumination to make it a little bit easier to get in and out of this car. And then we move on to the wheels. Now, remember when I told you aviation was a theme in this car? Well, the wheels aren't just some cool looking wheel with a nice design. Instead, they're designed to resemble a propeller from an old-time airplane. Maybe even more interesting than the propeller design is the fact that the Spyker has center lock wheels, not lug nuts. That design is usually used on race cars, and it would have been really rare in 2004 2000 when this car was originally being sold. But that's not my favorite thing about the center lock wheels. My favorite thing about the center lock wheels is the little guide printed on the wheels to let you know how to take them off. Instead of saying tighten or loosen, it says do and undo. <laughs> I think that may be a mistranslation from Dutch. I also like the fact that like in so many other places in this car, the center lock wheels have the Spiker logo on them. Very tiny print, but it's there. And then it's time to move inside to talk about maybe the most interesting propeller-related detail in this car, and that would be the steering wheel. Now, the early Spiker models came out with a steering wheel that resembled a propeller, and it has to be one of the coolest modern steering wheels in the entire car industry. Unfortunately, when the C8 was sold in the United States, they ditched the propeller wheel. I always assumed that was because of airbags, but this car has the next-generation Spiker wheel, and it doesn't have an airbag, so it doesn't have the propeller or an airbag. The owner tells me he really, really wants one, but they are absolutely impossible to find. Nobody who has one has given them up, and Spiker isn't making any more. Interestingly, the steering wheel in this car was made by Lotus, it just has the Spiker logo in the middle, and later Spiker models just used the steering wheel from a Lamborghini Gallardo. It wasn't really special at all but everybody wants that steering wheel with the propeller on it. Fortunately, the propeller theme was continued in at least one place in the interior, and that would be the climate control vents. There's only three, one for the driver, two for the passenger, and they are built tremendously well. Just moving them takes a surprising amount of force, but they do resemble a propeller just as the steering wheel did originally. And then we must talk about the shifter, which is probably this car's most famous design detail and by far the coolest shifter that has ever existed in any car Ferrari gated shifter, pah, it's nothing compared to this. The shifter is mounted on this giant metal bar that runs from the front to the back of the car, and the linkage that allows the shifter to change gear is exposed. Not only is that incredibly cool looking, but the thing just feels so mechanical, and it sounds mechanical. When you change gear, you can hear it go into every gear. and it is just the coolest thing in the world. This is one of the all-time great shifter designs, and it's one of the things I always think about when I think about Spiker. Another interesting Spiker C8 shifter fact, number one, you can't shift into reverse when the car is off. I've never seen that before in any other stick shift car. You have to turn the car on. And once you do, you can't shift into reverse unless you know the trick. The top of the shifter is actually a button. Push that, and that allows you to get all the way over to reverse. Otherwise, climb in a Spiker and try to steal it, and you don't know that, you'd probably never be able to back up. 
But the shifter is nowhere near the only cool thing or interesting quirk about the interior. As you can probably see from this angle, one of the craziest things about this interior is everything is aluminum, and I mean everything is aluminum. The entire dashboard is aluminum. The center console is aluminum, going all the way up between the seats where there's another Spiker propeller logo. Of course, the shifter is aluminum, as you already saw, and so is the top of the parking brake handle. Also aluminum are the turn signal levers and the lever for the high beams. The door grab handle is aluminum. Even the mirror controls are aluminum. The pedals are aluminum, too. And then you have the toggle switches. Yes, that's right, the toggle switches. Now, you've probably seen toggle switches to control various car functions in the Mini Cooper, but those are little baby toggle switches compared to this car. In this car, each toggle switch is fashioned out of a block of aluminum, and they are all tremendously hard to push. And there is a toggle switch for everything. This car doesn't have stupid plastic buttons like yours. You wanna turn on the wipers? Toggle switch. You wanna turn on the lights? Toggle switch. Fog lights, hazard lights. You can even put it in sport mode with the toggle switch, although the owner tells me it's really just sport for the exhaust. It makes the exhaust louder if it's in sport mode, or it's quiet mode if you take it out of sport mode. It doesn't actually do anything else to the rest of the car. There are toggle switches even for the climate control. Turn on air conditioning, toggle switch. Turn on the windshield defogger, toggle switch. Change where the air is coming out, toggle switch. It's all incredibly cool, it feels incredibly nice, and of course it is all incredibly aluminum. And then we have the item that goes hand in hand with the toggle switch, maybe even more impressive than the switches themselves. That would be the little lights for every little item that you turn on with the switches, like the headlights and the hazard lights. They each have their own housing. They're not just hidden in the gauge cluster in some little plastic cutout. Each one has its own individual spot on the dashboard and each one has its own individual housing and most of them light up in various colors like you'd expect. It is one of the craziest pieces of attention to detail I've ever seen just simply putting on the lights or the air conditioning in this car. And it's the same story with the other warning lights like for example the seatbelt warning light, the oil pressure, temperature warning light. Each one of those also has their own housing just above the climate controls. Which brings us to the climate controls. These are some of the most bizarre climate controls I've ever seen. It's hard to even really explain them, but basically there are two dials and you turn them. One is for temperature and one is for fan speed. Now, the temperature dial, you turn it from blue to red and it's not electronic. You can actually see the blue and red background changing as you turn the dial. The fan speed is the same deal. You turn it from min to max and as you turn it toward max, more and more lines appear inside the dial, giving it more and more fan speed. I've never seen it like this before, and it is so weird and so spiker. Oh, and by the way, before I get too far from the aluminum, like those little toggle switches, I should mention that even the owner's manual is aluminum in this car. It's separated into three separate books, each of which look like they were composed in Microsoft Word using the Tahoma font. Now, the interesting thing about the interior beyond the aluminum is just how much leather is in this interior. It's all full leather, even all the way down into the pedal box which is rare. Most car companies don't bother with leather down there because your feet go down there and your shoes and you'll never really look down there. But this car has leather down there and everywhere. And there's stitching in between and all green stitching to match the green exterior color of this car. In fact, virtually every surface of this interior is either leather or aluminum aside from the seat belt and the seat belt buckle. Those are the only two I've found that aren't. I'm serious. But no discussion of the toggle switches would be complete without discussing the power window switches. Now, they're located exactly where you'd expect on the door panel, like in your normal car, but they too are toggle switches and they too feel very heavy and require a lot of pressure if you want to roll the window up or down. Now, because the switches are aluminum, they couldn't exactly light them up, so instead, Spiker hides a little green light in the housing for the power window switches to illuminate them at night. It looks kind of like an alien is shining a light on your power window switches. Next up, back to the steering wheel and the horn. Now the leather pads in the steering wheel, they don't really do anything. You push them, nothing happens. The horn is only on the little spiker logo right in the middle. Push it, the horn sounds, and it sounds like a normal horn. Take a listen. Another interesting thing about the steering wheel, because they ditched the propeller wheel for this car, and this one has a thicker center, you can't actually see when you've turned on the turn signals or the high beams, which are the two stalks behind the steering wheel. So you're just kind of left to guess. The propeller wheel, you can easily see those things, but not in this one. So you put them on, and if you turn the wheel, you can see them, but if the wheel is in its normal straight position, you can't. And another interesting interior feature, this car has no seat controls, at least none that you can see. They're not on the side of the seat, they're not on the door, on the side of the door sill. 
actually they're hidden. There's two little buttons off to the right on the passenger seat and the left on the driver's seat. Aluminum, of course. You push it and they're power and they adjust the seat back. There's also a little lever you can use hidden near the back of the seat that allows for further seat adjustment. This lever, even though no one will ever see it, is, of course, aluminum. And still on the subject of weird buttons, next we have to discuss this car's starting procedure. It's an entire process. First, you have to have your foot on the clutch. That's pretty common in stick shift cars. Then you have to be in neutral. You can't start this car in gear. Then you go up to the dashboard and you find a little red cover over the ignition button. You lift up the cover just like in an airplane. Remember the aviation theme? And you turn on the ignition. That turns on the accessories to the car. Then you push the engine start stop button and only then does the car roar to life. The owner of this car tells me he leaves it unlocked everywhere because he figures no one will ever be able to figure out how to open the doors, much less actually get it started if they're trying to steal it. A couple of other interesting things in the interior of this car. How about the fact that even the cover over the rear view mirror is leather. In most cars, you'll never see the back of the rear view mirror, but in this car, because of that frameless glass, the fact that the mirror is mounted right on it, you will see the back of the mirror. So they covered it in leather, like just about everything else in this interior. Then there's one of my favorite spiker corks, and that would be the glove box. Pull the aluminum handle, of course, and the glove box opens, and that's normal. Pull it more, and it opens even more. It's got this dual opening action in the glove box, and it's very odd. Nonetheless, it's kind of cool. Now, the glove box hides one of this car's most bizarre and unusual quirks, and that would be the second ignition. Now, like a lot of newer cars, this car has a proximity key, so it recognizes when the key is inside, and when it senses that, it allows you to turn on the ignition and press that little start button to start the car. But if for some reason it isn't recognizing the key, you have a backup option in the glove box. There is a little ignition in there that can be turned on with an actual key. And so if you want to start the car without using the regular starter button, you lean over to the glove box, put the key in, twist it, and then that's another way you can start the spiker. It's the hidden ignition switch that no one will ever know about. I've seen a few cars with secondary ignition switches in case the button fails, but I've never seen one that hides it in the glove box. That is quite unusual. Now, you can see that this car is using an Audi key, and like I mentioned before, it has an Audi V8 engine. Now, the spiker actually had its own unique key with a very unique design. It was fitting to the rest of the car, but for whatever reason, this spiker wasn't delivered to this owner used with that key, so he just uses the Audi key. Although he doesn't really use it, right, because he presses the starter button every time he gets inside, you would only use the key if you were going to get into the glove box and activate the secondary ignition switch. Something else I really like about that whole secondary ignition in the glove box thing is that if the battery in your key fob fails and thus the car doesn't detect the key fob anymore so the starter button won't work, you have to reach all the way over there into the glove box to turn on the car, but you also have to go through that whole starting procedure so you have to have your foot on the clutch while simultaneously reaching over to the glove box. They couldn't have possibly put it in a less convenient location. And speaking of things that are not very convenient, how about the parking brake which is mounted not over here in the driver's side or in the middle but in the passenger side footwell. Well, also interesting are the Spiker's gauges. They are, of course, surrounded in aluminum, and they use a very classy font. They also have the Spiker logo inside them and the word Spiker written in Spiker's script. I suppose they're not all that unusual, but they're worth looking at. And then we have the final interesting detail of the interior, and that would be the door handles. This car has two doors, but it has three door handles. One in the driver door, one in the passenger door, and then they use another door handle so you can open the hood. It's not some weird hood latch or hood release like in every other car. It's the exact same aluminum door handle they use on the doors. Now, once you open the Spiker's engine cover, you'll discover that this isn't just an engine cover. Of course, the engine is back here, the Audi V8 mid-mounted right behind the seats, but this is also where the trunk is. The two share space under the engine cover. The trunk is leather lined once again, beautiful with green stitching and green carpeting to match the outside of the car. A couple of interesting things about the engine are the VW and Audi logos you'll find if you look closely. After all, it is an Audi V8. Although it doesn't have Audi printed across the top of the engine like it does when it's installed in an Audi, there's a VW logo here and an Audi logo here. And if you look on the door latch, you'll find an Audi logo too. Interestingly, there's a little bit of spiker in this engine too. There's a little yellow label with a picture of a spiker on it placed under the hood. It shows you exactly how much you're supposed to tighten the wheels using the center lock wheel tightening tool. 
And that tool to tighten or remove the wheels can be found up here. Now, this is the front of the car. There's no storage up here, but you can see the entire front clamshell comes up, revealing basically all of the car's inner workings, including the inboard suspension, which is kind of a cool look. Now, that tool, the one that tightens and loosens the wheels, that is found inside the toolkit, which is stuck down here under a leather strap. You'd never know it was there unless you knew it was there. We pulled out the toolkit a minute ago. This is the first time the owner had ever taken it out, and it's actually surprising surprisingly comprehensive. It has all the tools you'd expect, a screwdriver, the wheel tightener. It also has bulbs, and then it has my favorite thing, an extra key fob battery. And the key fob in this car is really important because it's a proximity key, and that's how you turn the car on. So if the battery dies, you got an extra. Another interesting thing under the clamshell, that would be something that most spiker owners probably don't even know about. That is the battery cutoff and the lockout. Now, here's how this works. There's a little on-off switch for the battery located underneath here. You can turn the battery off if you're going to park this car for a while and you don't want someone to come up and steal it. Now, that's not that uncommon, but what is uncommon is the little spot where you can place the key in order to lock the clamshell. Normally, it's covered with this little aluminum cover, but you move the cover to the side and you can lock or unlock the clamshell. So theoretically, you could turn off the battery, lock the clamshell, and then no one will be able to get inside this car in order to turn it on. That's a really good idea in a car like this with a proximity key, because if you just grab the key, and if you can figure out how to open the door and then turn on the ignition and start the car, you can just drive away in it. But if you've locked the clamshell with the hidden little key lock and turn off the battery, no one will ever be able to start this car unless they know how to do that stuff, which no one will unless they've seen this video. And then, of course, there's the all-important exhaust note. And so those are all the weird quirks and the cool features of the Spiker C8 Spider. I told you it was full of them. Now it's time to get this thing out on the road and see just how well the Dutch can make an exotic sports car. Driving the Spiker. is just how exposed you are. There's not even sun visors, and so you're just completely open to the world. There's just glass, and then the rim of the glass, and then there's just, there's the world out there. You're so open in this car. There are those roll hoops behind the seats, but from where I'm sitting, it looks like if there was a rollover, we would just be killed. Then instantly, you just hear the sound. This car sounds, uh, it, it, the tone of the exhaust isn't the best I've heard, but just a little bit of throttle gives you that exhaust note. It's amazing. I love moving the shifter. It feels like I'm really doing something. It feels like I, I matter in this world. I, it sounds great. It feels great moving the shifter. I know that's a big thing everybody's always wondering about with this car. And the answer is it's just as good as you were hoping it would be. It doesn't look like a usual shifter, but you you never feel like you're gonna screw up. <laughs> the sound is so good and it's, the exhaust are moved up a little higher than in a normal car. And of course, because it's open, you just hear it and hear it and hear it. The steering is great. It's really precise. There's a little bit of vagueness on center. Ultimately, this is over a 10 year old car, but not much. The car is really well balanced, you can tell. This car, this is the brightest I've ever driven a car. There's, there's really nothing to stop just sun from coming at you. This is the perfect Southern California car. The, the brake pedal is quite interesting. There's a lot of travel to the brake pedal and you really kind of have to give it a deep stab if you actually want to stop. Um, it's a little unnerving at first coming up to a hard corner. It's like you put on the brake and nothing really happens. Then you really have to put on the brake. Sound is just, oh, I love it. It's just there and there and there. There's just sound for days in this car. Nonetheless, the drawback is this isn't a car you're gonna be able to have a conversation and hang out with someone and just relax in. Between the wind coming all around the cabin, there's not really a top you wanna to use, and the sound, there's a lot of noise in this thing. The ride quality is pretty good. It's a little harsh, uh, but it's a sports car, and so it's supposed to be. You do hear some creaking and stuff, mainly from the windows. Handling is excellent, very predictable, but you really gotta get on the brake in order to slow this car down. I'm actually surprised by it. Something that's very unsettling immediately. All right, I got a straightaway here. I'm gonna open it up a little bit. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. The sound is so amazing. This car is not tremendously fast. I don't even think it's as fast as the R8, 
uh, but you don't really even care all that much when you're driving it uh, because you're having so much fun doing all sorts of other stuff. I just can't believe even driving this car, I can't, I'm going probably 30, but it feels like such an event. Not only is the interior so cool, but the sound is so amazing. The glass feels like I'm doing something very special today. So that's the Spiker C8 Spider, one of just a few hundred in the world, probably one of just a few dozen in the United States, a Dutch exotic car with an Audi V8 and the longest list of quirks and features I think I've ever seen. In other words, all the makings of an excellent YouTube video. Anyway, time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I like how the Spiker looks, but I understand that some people think it's a little overstyled. Visually, there's a lot to take in, and it certainly isn't classically beautiful, but it's definitely cool looking. I'm giving it a 7 out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The C8 does 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds, giving it a 7 out of 10. For handling, the Spiker is good, but not the best. It's precise and sharp for its time, but modern cars are a few steps forward, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor, however, is massive. I've been to cars and coffee events where spikers have shown up and the entire thing empties to go look at the spiker. When I posted a picture of this car on my Instagram, it quickly became the most liked car I had ever posted, more than the 918 Spider. To me, it falls only just short of the Ultra cars, earning a 9 out of 10. Importance, however, is the opposite. The C8 is cool, sure, but it doesn't hail from a highly significant automaker and the engine is built by someone else. I struggled to give it more than a 6 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to a 35 out of 50 which is a strong showing. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The Spiker does predictably badly as it focuses more on quality and beauty than equipment, and it gets a 3 out of 10. As for comfort, the ride is harsh, but typical of sports cars, and it earns a 4 out of 10. Quality, however, is a strong suit. This is probably the nicest interior I've ever been in, in terms of layout and overall feel and look of materials. This car would get a 10 if that was the only item this category measured, but quality also considers reliability, and Audi is not exactly known for dependable drivetrains, and then there's the question of finding someone to work on this car. Still, for that interior, I can't give it anything less than an 8 out of 10. Practicality is low. This car has only two seats, not much of a top, and just 4.2 cubic feet of cargo space, giving it a 2 out of 10. Finally, there's value. This car has held its value well, but it's still tremendously expensive, especially compared to the R8, which has a similar powertrain. It gets a 7 out of 10, mainly for its strong residuals, bringing the total daily score to 24 out of 50. Add it up and the total Doug score is 59, which is decent, but not amazing. Then again, the C8 is an unusual car, head turning and cool, ultra high quality, but filled with weird quirks. It's an acquired taste that only appeals to certain people.